Hello and welcome. He's recognized as one of India's most influential media entrepreneurs, having innovated the way people watch television throughout the country. And he's grown his media empire into one that shapes the industry rather than follows it. This week on 101, meet the founder of the giant India media group, UTV, Ronnie Skruvala. Rohinton, or Ronnie Skruvala, is considered a pioneer of cable TV in India, launching the network in Mumbai in June 1981. Within a decade, UTV was born, growing rapidly from software communications to film and TV production and distribution, and then on to creating TV channels. Ever the entrepreneur, Ronnie Skruvala continues to look for opportunities to expand his media empire, even partnering up with top companies from Hollywood. Ronnie Skruvala, what a good chance to chat with you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, it's interesting, back in 2008, Esquire magazine listed you as one of the 75 most influential people of the 21st century. To what degree did that vindicate all the challenges that you faced and the, and the risks you've taken? Well, I think, you know, I mean, recognition like that or, or, or an acknowledgement is just, it's nice. It's nice and then you move on. I think uh, the fact that actually more and more people from Asia are put into an international perspective, I think definitely happens that. So I don't think it was a vindication. I think it was an, maybe an endorsement to a certain extent and a good tailwind for what we think we're doing to put ourselves on the global map. Now it says that, you know, it's also been said that you're trying to drag Bollywood into the 21st century. Is it really that far behind? No, I think the, 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 the connotation from the West is always that if anything is changing, then it's changing drag, uh, gradually, and I think everyone's dragging everyone. I think the, the younger generation here, the youth of India have actually redefined how everyone consumes content in this country. So I think that's really been the sort of motion point for everyone to be moved. I don't think anyone's dragging anyone. What about the way a lot of people are worried about the way it's gone down the avenue of, uh, you know, the sort of too much sex and violence and kind of things have changed, copying the sort of Western model, but the sort of classic tradition and culture seems to have disappeared to some degree. Well, when you get to multiple genres, I mean, if it was the family dramas, everyone was complaining there are too many family dramas. So then you need genres. So in genres, there'll be comedy, but there'll also be action. There'll be various aspects. I, I dare say that there isn't that much of sex in our movies yet. <laughs> well, you know, one thing that, uh, that has happened is that um, over the years, um, the industry is far more influenced by the West. Um, to what degree should India be exporting rather than importing? Because you're one of those who imports as well. Yes. No, I think exporting in the sense, well, if you, look at, if you look at all our broadcasting networks from here, they're pretty much in most of the countries in the world on some DTH platform or some IPTV platform. I think our movies go out and get premiered in about 46 different countries on th in theaters. And outside of that, they go into almost every network or terrestrial network in the world. So there's a fair amount of, but I think our grammar and the way we communicate, whether it's in short form, small screen or big screen is always very different. Now you're credited with uh, growing the, the, the biggest media group in India um, and certainly one of the most diverse as well. But things change day by day. What are the biggest challenges you face? I think in the diversity itself isn't a challenge because, to be honest, nobody understands the conglomerate model in, in, in India or, frankly, in Asia. It's, it's more relegated to the West because that's how they've been sort of evolved. So I think we're at early stages to establish that when you're looking at a diversified model, it doesn't necessarily reflect lack of focus because that's the normal nomenclature that comes with it. But you, if you have uh, more channels, that doesn't necessarily mean better choice, certainly in terms of quality. That can often be diluted. If you're talking about the overall broadcast situation in the country and the fact that everyone thinks we have 400 channels, actually if you slice and dice it, about 100 of them are just by default because the footprints of the satellites over Asia just go over 52 countries. If you narrow that down between all our languages and genres, you're actually looking at for a core audience of anyone, about 40 to 50 channels directed at uh, a multiple core audience. Now you have different genres, you say that's a, that's a valuable thing of course because people have choice, but when it goes very much down the avenue of reality TV, um, are you worried that sort of real quality does disappear? No, I think reality TV has brought about, it, it's the first thing that's broken the mold on the soap operas from that point of view. I think it's very live and I think reality TV at the end of the day displays the cultural values of a country. It also talks about the impromptuness and I think it's a sense of expression. People are now look at television, which is otherwise a passive medium, into an interactive medium. I can participate in on it, I can, I can control his destiny, I can SMS and get somebody to win or lose. So it's, it's changed the fabric of how television is viewed in the country. You, you part, you're known for partnering with the West. You've done some very successful partnerships. Um, how, while doing that, how do you ensure that you still grow talent at home? 
I think the partnerships that we've done with the West have been actually very constructive because they've looked at us being strong people who know this part of Asia and how they can partner well. So they've pretty much, the partnerships have been to grow ourselves independently here and not necessarily being influenced. And I think that's what works. Well, let's find out what's shaped you. You were, you were born in Bombay. Yes. And uh, I mean, the heart of Bombay's Hollywood, Bollywood, as they call it as well. Uh, what were those early years like here? Well, I think the schooling system in India is fr frankly terrific. As compared to the West, I think we were very strong. I think when it comes to college, it starts plummeting. So best memories everyone has is about school. College is about not being in college, but having all the fun that you want for that three to four years before you get into the real life. So I think that's the sort of texture of the memories when you come back to that. What was your family situation like? What the kind of uh, sort of environment did you tend to thrive in? I, I think, well, my father was a professional uh, for, a, for a pharmaceutical and a cosmetic company. And I think, um, I think early days in everything to do we would want to do in media. I think my, my interest in theater were to a certain extent sparkled my interest in media. Uh, then we started off with cable television. So these were all very, very early days. So very exciting days. And I think that get, gets you into the entrepreneurial bug. In terms of your character, how did your father influence you? What sort of characteristics do you think you inherited from him? Well, I think uh, parental guidance always comes in having a balance. So I think between both mom and dad, it was the influence was much more being balanced, uh, sense of integrity, a sense of, uh, sense of being up right up front and natural. And I think that has really stood us and stood me in good stead. Was the Parsi identity very important? Because it, it's a small community, but very close as well. Uh, I think it's not very close-knit. It is close-knit because it's about 65,000 in the world. But I think there was a sense of good sense of pride. Uh, I, don't, I don't necessarily feel that it stood me in advantage or disadvantage, but it's nice. What happened in terms of um, your schooling? What were you initially aiming for? Well, uh, my father wanted me to go out and do my child accountancy. Uh, and that would have been six years away into child accountancy. So at that stage, I was at that cusp where I said, I want to start a business. And he said, you've got to get a degree. And I said, but a six-year degree sounds like a lot. So finally, I went and started and to become an entrepreneur on from day one. What, uh, what challenges did you face at that time in, in India? Because it's only more in recent years that things have opened up, certainly in terms of uh, allowing people to grow business. Yeah, I think the challenge was two, three. One is from a monetary point of view, it was, it was very challenging for anyone to get any sense of encouragement. Private, equ private equity was almost non-existent. Debt was extremely expensive. We still have one of the highest interest countries in the world. And tremendous amount of export, uh, I'm sorry, import more actually uh, restrictions in that. So I think all of those really test your talent. So I, as, as I think people now realize, if you've survived and done good business in India, you can, you can operate anywhere in the world. What about the talent pool here? Because of course you have very smart people, but being academically smart doesn't necessarily mean that they are the right kind of either entrepreneurial type of staff that you might need to grow a new business, uh, and certainly a new media, growing media, or also uh, they might not be the kind of people who can and, uh, deliver the things you need uh, the way you well I'd say entrepreneurially there's a tremendous amount of talent in this country and I think again it's part of the evolution of finding a solution if you're a leader and you you've got to find a solution and in India we're good at finding solutions now to most that would raise an eyebrow and say you'll find solution at any cost but I'm saying devoid of that 5% that would do that 95% actually find constructive so that that's the positive part when you come to entrepreneurship I think in media it's been a very very evolving situation so trained talent is is a difficulty Homegrown talent takes time, and attracting talent from outside industries is always a challenge till you feel that this is a career path that people want to pursue. I still think we haven't sorted that out. How do your family regard those initial steps into the media? How do they, they, they view it? Uh, well, sort of, as always with parents, sort of mutually encouraging, but with a high level of concern. <laughs> and of course, your, your wife, Zarina, was a co-founder with you with yeah. UTV, and that, yeah. uh, presumably that was a big support as well, having yeah. someone who understood no, I, th the I think we had, a good, we had a good team from day one. It was a team that, that, that had the passion, and I think that reflects the culture of what we do even today. Very strong passion, very sense, strong sense of innovation, and a high degree of creativity and, and commercial both. How, in, in living in a country like India, of course, you, it's, it is a challenge because you have such diversity of uh, economic strata. Uh, and I wonder, when you, you're having to cater for such a diverse range of people, how, how do you remain sensitive to the fact that there's so many people who have so little here, and of course, the few who have so much? Well, actually, you've got to break it up into your core groups at any given stage. So when we're creating content, would need to be for core groups and core demographics. I think the people who consume different mediums at different stages would have that. But I think there's... The key part on content that has worked universally for India is aspirational. 
So I think you're not alienating anything else if your content is aspirational. And I think that's been the sort of dividing and defining line. Now, have those aspirations changed? Do you have to, do you have to watch out for changing aspirations? Absolutely. I think the aspirations have changed dramatically every two to three years. And especially if you look at the young audience, they change almost every two years here. Yeah. So take me through those early steps of creating the company and what really the, the, what you did to, to get started. Well, I think part of our ex uh, my experience was when we started cable TV in India. Those were good in early days, 1981. So basically, you had a terrestrial network and television sets that didn't even own a remote. So to get people to figure out that you can actually switch a channel and have an alternate to your content was really the one. So for one and a half years, we did concept selling by going into building societies, getting all the residents down on a Sunday morning, explaining to them that here's your channel and here's an alternative channel that we can give you on cable TV. So that concept selling worked, and I think that's how we started in cable TV. Now it's grown into 85 million homes, but we exited the business about seven years from 1981 when we started that because I think it, it then became very unruly, very unstructured. And I think the today's structure in broadcasting or in media today, I think there's one lack is the regulation in, 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 in cable. I was wondering about that, how you had to deal with the regulations because when an industry is changing so quickly, of course, the, the regulators are trying to keep up with the changes and presumably protect the viewers and so on. But how did you cope with the, the regulations? Well, there wasn't any regulation. And I think 25 years later, there still isn't any regulation. I think when the regulators don't understand a medium, they just leave it alone. And I think the good part of that is they left the media industry alone most of the time, which is why it's grown quite well. Similarly, like the IT industry, when they when it started mushrooming, I don't think anyone really grasped the power of what India could be for an, as an IT hub, and they just let it be. Ronnie, I have more questions for you in just a moment. More one-on-one -on -one with Ronnie Skruvala when we return. <music> Welcome back. You're watching one-on-one. -on -one. We're speaking with Indian media entrepreneur Ronnie Skruvala. Your, your initial steps bringing cable TV to India and, and then persuading them to uh, people here to look at, uh, at daytime soap operas, how, how receptive were they to the ideas? Um, I think in the metropolitan cities they were. When it came to soap operas, they became very receptive. I think the cable TV concept took a lot more time. I think the first decade, uh, everyone achieved maybe a million, million, million bases as compared to the 85 now. But I think when it came to soap operas, at that time there was only a terrestrial network. And afternoon viewing for an entire subsect of housewives was huge. So actually it became as big as prime time. How much of a challenge is it that India has so many languages too? I think it's an opportunity. I think it's an opportunity, more or less. I wouldn't consider it a challenge. I think that's the, that's the fun, that's the dynamism of the industry, and it's a tremendous opportunity. But it's quite competitive between the languages because people expected, as the television industry grew, they expected uh, more programming in their own tongue, presumably. Absolutely. I mean, I think that the national language, that, or at least what everyone says is Hindi is the national language, is less than 50% speak it. So the south of India actually is a lot more strong when it comes to their own regional languages. I think the north of India, uh, it's a bit of a... Uh, soft issue. From your perspective, what is the most radical change you brought about to the Indian media? I think pushing the levels of content and innovation. I mean, whether we did that in television when there was no daily soap opera, to afternoon soap operas, to when we started in motion pictures to that extent also, it was, we were very clear we were looking at targeting the core youth, the 15 to the 24 with a wider group of 15 to 34. And I think that that's pushing the envelope on, on content for an evolving audience has really been our strength. What do you see as the defining moments in, in your career as you've been building it? Well, I think, um, I think the, the cable part was one aspect because I think it kind of put the bedrock of media in that context. I think the, the evolution of satellite television in the country, which started off around 92, 93, was I think the next evolution. And I think 2000 overall for the industry was when really media became a diversified me medium. Uh, specifically for UTV, I think it's r the real change started happening in 2006 when we moved from being a B2B company to a B2C company. What about um, technology? How has that helped you? Technology is something that we harness all the time. So I think it's helped us. I think India is still very, very early days. So I can't say it helps, uh, it helps us great, greatly because everyone's... The, the, it's a niche audience that's harnessed technology, and I think that's going to change as we go forward. So I think it's more the opportunity of the future than what it is today. When you look back on what, what you've grown over the years, what were the worst moments? Uh, I think worst would be the changing and evolving times across. I think this is a business where preempting where you're going next is almost impossible. So I think there's a certain element of a 25% stress level that you just can't 
switch off on. So I would say that's that, that's that con continuing numbing one-fourth uh, process where you're constantly feeling, am I doing the right thing? Because at the end of the day, it's an evolving business, and media in itself is an unpredictable business, and you've got to build scalability and predictability in an unpredictable business. So I think there's that, that coefficient where you're always taking the big leap. And I think it's not for the faint-hearted. The entire business of media is not for the faint-hearted. So I think that also plays a big role. Any major missteps that you recall? Tons of them. <laughs> Tons of them. Tons of them. I think I'm a, I'm a strong advocate that if you can get six out of ten right, I think you're fine. Because if you start getting to eight out of ten right, you're not experimenting. So, I mean, you know, we, we, I pioneered with started home shopping this country, and I think it was about five years before its time. So I think that taught me a very strong lesson of the sort of sliver difference between pioneering and being before your time. What about um, the movie business? Because I know you had one or two rough experiences with uh, the movie business too, and it's the Western movies, as in uh, producing those. I think uh, specifically when, when we went in the West, it was really because we were looking at Indian originated directors. So Mira and I are something that we've had a long relationship, and therefore namesake for us actually was a good experience. And the other one was Happening, which I think uh, from M. Nights is not one of his greatest, but considering the budget and the Philadelphia grants that we got, I think it worked out pretty well, finally. Now, when you partner with Western companies, powerful large corporations such as Disney, Fox Searchlight, and Sony, to what extent are you coming in from a sort of underdog position that they have the they hold the cards I mean who needs who the most no I don't think we ever come down from an underdog position look at that never makes the bedrock of partnerships I don't think I've felt that way neither have they made me feel that way neither have we've perceived ourselves that way at all I think it is uh, and I don't think I want to define that you know we, they need us more than we need them because that's incorrect too I think the partnerships especially with Disney for example uh, to them you know in India and, and emerging markets is a huge one and I think they've They've gone down the route that partnerships is, is a, is a long-term solution from, from, a, from a growth perspective. So I think it's a mutual, mutual relationships. And if it's not there, and if you don't get that litmus test, you're not going to have long-term relationships. I was thinking in terms of the way such large corporations, because of their, their clout, can dictate so much. And they tend to micromanage a lot of things as well from, from I've not found that experience at all, to be honest. What went, what went through your mind when you listed on India's stock exchange? What sort of, and how did that change uh, the way your company was, uh, the dynamics of your company? Uh, I think the good parts, obviously, for, for a float is that it gets you at a different tempo, and it gets you accountable, and it gets you into a profile. And I think those are, those are, what's we, those are the reasons why we actually did list, because we wanted to go to the next level of profile. I think, um, obviously, the challenge specifically in media is that it's not a quarter-to-quarter -quarter business. And that's something that we love to just live with as part of the cons. Uh, the second and most important one is, I think, again, media is still not understood. It's half less understood and half misunderstood. So between the two, you've got to really over-communicate. But in a sense, that's a good challenge because then you're really over-communicating. That over-communication gets you a lot of feedback, and it gets you to introspect on your business model in a much sharper contrast. When you're pioneering, as you have, um, it's hard to find people who've got the experience they can share with you. So who are your mentors uh, professionally and then, I guess, personally as well? Actually, I've not really. It's been different fabrics and different. So, I mean, I would love to say that I do have them. I haven't got anyone cleanly identified, to be honest. It's in different facets. I think in retail, when I started home shopping, I think the Sam Walton way was something that inspired me to get into that. Uh, but if you look at that few and far between, it would be in, in slice and dice. So when you, did you not see any Western models and say, okay, I can see, I can, you know, going down this path or learn from their lessons? No. No, I think Western models would, the scale, the scale is different. If you start plotting on that basis, you can make some seriously big mistakes. What is it that specific about India, do you think, that, that what is it that India offers <clears throat> that, that other markets don't? What, it's a huge domestic market, and I think it's also something that has a high level of intrigue that if you get it right, there's a level of creativity here that we can go out and explode uh, outside. I think it's been a lack of, lack of the goals and the guts to do it. I think it's a lack of marketing and, and perception building to a certain extent. And then I think because we've not really experienced that, we're quite an insulated one. So the downside is that we're insulated. So if you're insulated, you can't really visualize what the rest of the world would want unless you're actually out there. And of course, Slumdog Millionaire and films like that have helped to boost India's image in the West. Yeah. May not be the ideal way to do it, looking at, you know, obviously the poverty, for example. I know that angered a lot of people here. But, but in terms of what those kind of movies do to uh, boost India's image as a, as a place to do business, what have you found? I haven't found that. I think I've found is that, that basically, if you look at that kind of content, now most of the West don't want to miss out on an opportunity to look at anything else that comes out of India, but with their selfish interest of, of trying to spot an opportunity that they may have missed, because there's a fair amount of them, they almost missed that opportunity too. It's a movie that half the studios didn't pick up, Searchlight did, and you know, 
the rest was history. Of course, you know, one of the, the, you said one of the challenges is, is that knowing what's coming up, you know, looking ahead and, and trying to plan for that. But what long-term goals have you set yourself? I think clearly, the, the, as I said, the diversified model, because I think media from India is going to be scalable in all aspects. So there is absolutely no reason why you can't have a scalable conglomerate from here. And if you look at the media landscape today, actually India is really the hot spot. I don't think anyone can ignore that. It's not a market that it would be a go-to market, it would be much more than that, because you've got China, which has pretty much closed their doors. If you look at a the rest of Southeast Asia, there are no scalable models. Europe and UK is pretty much flat, and sort of so mature and so flat and so non-grown. So where are the opportunities? Middle East is insular in its way. I mean, most of what happens in, in the Middle East and Dubai, content is created in Egypt. So if you look at that, this is really one of the only spots. Japan is extremely insular, and the US is overdeveloped. So where do you go? Mm. If, there's any, if there's any lesson you, you think you've learned from your upbringing, your family life, what would it be? I think it's integrity of life, and I think it's the balanced approach, and I think it's say it as it is from that perspective. I think uh, in my early days, you know, whether I'd done well or not in school or college, the idea was to come home and say, this is what I've done, this is what it is, so you've passed on the burden to somebody else, and it's a good feeling. And I think uh, today, I, I still, most of my family, especially my daughter, always says that I'm very insular and, and I need to open up, so I think that's the mix and match that I need to s still work on. Are you competitive? Do you feel a competitive spirit? Very competitive, very competitive. Now, in terms of your own, your own sort of personal time in life, do you find downtime, do you find time to pursue hobbies and actually give yourself some time to chill? I think it's a matter of choice. I think you can always find time, and there are, there's, there are cycles in that process when you do and you don't. So I think it just depends on what you enjoy and what you don't. But I think it would be a cop-out if you say that if you, you, you wouldn't find the time. It is, but I think part of the balance is that if you're in this kind of business in an entrepreneurial manner, there's so much a passion that goes into that that you've got to really enjoy what you're doing. So in a sense, it has to be your fun, and it has to be your joy at work, and it has to be a part of your hobby come work. Now, as, 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 as distinct as that sounds, that's what it is. What about you in downtime? What do you do? Read, um, just spend time with the family, chill, stare out of the window. <laughs> <laughs> if, you want to, if you want to be remembered a certain way, what would you like your legacy to be? Um, pushing the envelope pioneering and I think giving that spirit that I think that that sense of being able to take the risk and go forward is something and if you can set right examples and benchmarks for that and people can draw inspiration from that I think that's what it's about because it's about progress. Ronnie great talking with you thank you. Lovely thank you. Thanks.